Good evening, everybody. My name is Gila Franklin Siegel. I'm the Associate Director of the Jewish Community Relations Council of Greater Washington. And I welcome you to our book talk this evening. I'm so thrilled that you're with us. And we are so thrilled to be hosting Jennifer Rosner again. Um, the JCRC, for those of you who don't know, is the umbrella group for over 100 synagogues, Jewish schools, and other Jewish institutions in the greater Washington, D.C. area. We have a very wide mandate. We focus on Israel education and advocacy, um, local government affairs <coughs> and lobbying um, in Maryland, Virginia, and the District of Columbia, Holocaust education and remembrance, um, and, uh, I, and a range of other social justice issues, um, including uh, working to advocate for refugees and immigrants um, and combat, and most importantly, combating anti-Semitism and other forms of hatred. Um, so, and we just finished uh, coming off of Yom HaShoah, a week of um, very um, diverse programming within the DMV um, focused on everything from our annual Yom HaShoah commemoration, um, which reached almost 2,000 people, to our Dor La Dor um, uh, and Holocaust survivor programming, which reached over 1,000 students and adults um, meeting with Holocaust survivors, um, to uh, proclamations and uh, legislative efforts surrounding the Holocaust and combating hatred. So this is a nice capstone to all of those efforts over the last 10 days. And it really um, is uh, such a delight for me. Um, though for those of you, there may be some of you who were on our book talk at the beginning of the pandemic um, when the Yellowbird Sings first came out. And at that time, Jennifer um, said that she was already working on this book. So we really are thrilled um, to have her with us. Um, so I want to share a little bit about Jennifer. She's the author of the novels Once We Were Home and the Yellow Bird Sings, which was a National Jewish Book Award finalist um, and a Massachusetts Book Award honor book. Her other books include the memoir If a Tree Falls, A Family's Quest to Hear and Be Heard, and the picture book The Mitten String, which was a Sidney Taylor Book Award notable. Jennifer's work has been translated into a dozen languages. Her short writings have appeared in the New York Times, the Times of Israel, the Forward, and elsewhere. In addition to writing, Jennifer has taught philosophy and she holds a PhD from Stanford and a BA from Columbia. She lives in Western Massachusetts with her family. So thank you, Jennifer, for being here with us. And um, I have to tell you, I read Once We Were Home um, over Passover, and I didn't think anything could top the yellow bird sings because it was so beautifully and lyrically written. But once we were home, um, was so impactful and compelling in terms of the story it told. Um, I have been um, involved. I grew up around Holocaust survivors and their children, and have been involved in this work for 25 years. And I learned so much from this book. Um, and I'm sure the same can be said of so many others uh, on this. Uh, program tonight who have also read it. So um, if we, I would love to start just by um, asking you what compelled you as your second novel to choose this story about the saga of hidden children, Jewish hidden children after the Shoah. Um, what compelled you to write it? What research did you do? What actual history is it based on? Thank you so much. I'm I'm so happy to be here and um, really great to be in conversation with you. Um, well, so while I was doing research for the Yellow Bird Sings, I met a woman who um, she she told me her experience, which was that she had been in a Siberian labor camp during the war. She was charged with cutting down primeval forests, and when she returned to her native Poland she found that just about 3% of Jewish children had survived and most of them were in Christian settings in Polish homes and convents and the like. And um, with adopted names, you know, with Christian names, et cetera. And she, 
the, the emission kind of grew to try to retrieve those children because this, you know, everyone, you know, there has been so much loss and annihilation. And then the idea of leaving these children, there were several parts to this. One was the idea that they, they should get those children back into Judaism to rebuild this collective. Part of it was maybe an idea that it would be honoring the dead parents wishes to leave descendants that these children should be raised Jewish and not left into in a Christian setting. There was an, also a feeling that Poland was very dangerous and it highly anti Semitic after the war as well as during and even if the rescue family was warm and loving and accepting of these Jewish children, there might be neighbors who weren't and there was a lot of violence still. And so I think the idea for like a woman like the one I interviewed, the idea of she could have gone by herself to Palestine, but to leave children behind, it was like an intolerable feeling to leave them there. And and so there, this mission grew and there were, it, it was a pretty complex. There were different groups and they had different political views and different religious views, but um, there was one kind of umbrella organization, the coordination for the redemption of Jewish children. And um, there were some Zionist groups within that. And this woman worked within, in that group. And um, in any case, the, you know, they would try to negotiate, like they would try to find where those children were, then they would go to the families and try to offer money offer money was supplied by US sources by sources in Palestine. And um, if the sometimes those Polish families, first of all, they had hidden these children at great danger and also at great expense, and they were very, very poor. So um, sometimes they did just they took the money and they let the children go, but there were families who did not want to let the children go. And then there were these, these, um, you know, Jewish reclamation people were kind of forced to do some tough stuff like they, you know, this woman described how she would go at dusk and just steal them, just grab them, just take them on in a truck, do whatever they had to do. They felt a real moral imperative to do it. And um, they just wanted to get those children. And I can tell you if you want, if we have time or whatever, there were like, sort of really kind of Cre creative ruses like there would be a there would be like a um like a, a phony power of attorney letter there would be a fake wedding invitation they would ask to go to the seamstress with the child for this you know aunt's wedding and then while the polish mother was sitting in the waiting room the jewish child was in the dressing room then grabbed through the side door and out and just taken and there were they were just doing it by hook and by crook to try to make sure they could get those children and as I was listening to this, I was, first of all, I had never heard this history. I thought it, I, I, you know, after studying a lot about um, the Holocaust and after aftermath, I was shocked by this history at all, but then thought to myself that it was really complicated and morally blurry. Like it's very understandable, the feeling of the moral imperative, but then like from the child's perspective, what it might must've been like. So for, so, so that, the answer to that really has to do a lot with the age of the child, what they remembered of their Jewish roots, what their relationship was in this in this new family they were in, et cetera. So if you were just like essentially a farmhand and they were kind of giving you scraps or whatever, maybe leaving would be okay. But for children who were very bonded with um, their rescue family, it could be a huge rupture. And it was a rupture on top of the first rupture of losing their, their Jewish family. And there's so much to say, and I'm sure we'll get into it, but the children weren't going back to their families. Their parents have perished and they were going to, to Judaism. So they were going to a children's home and maybe they would get on a, eventually go from, you know, to a, onto a boat and get to Palestine to go to a kibbutz. So they were, there was something abstract about it. They were going back to Judaism and, and um, you know, there, it was communal, but it, it wasn't a family. <laughs> exactly. So all that stuff was kind of going on in my mind as I was thinking about this particular case. And my novel like started, I was writing about Oscar and Anna first, and I didn't even know I was going to add other storylines. But then I learned of a case of um, a child who was in a convent and when actually surviving relatives came, the church actually took those children sort of on the run and hid them from being taken back in order to save their Christian souls. And then I learned of another case where, you know, a, a very large number of Polish Christian children were being moved um, basically by Germans who were trying to Germanize children and bolster the German population in a certain way. So 
all of a sudden I'm dealing with all these different cases of children being moved around in, in or just after wartime. And, and I was really focused on like what that does for a child's sense of identity, for belonging, for sense of home, for how you could ever reroute after that kind of rupture. And, um, and as regards the research, I mean, maybe quickly I'll share my screen and just show you a couple of quick pictures if I have the capacity, which is a, a good question. Um, let's see if this works. Yes. Okay. So this is a picture that's, um, it's, oops, hang on. It's, uh, this is a picture, the, the one, uh, there's this woman, she's quite young, she's shepherding children that she has um, probably taken from children's homes and is on a journey. And there was this historian in Israel who shared with me, I mean, she did incredible amounts of research. I'm just gonna show you if you can, I don't know, maybe I should show you that after, or can you see this book? Yes. Dividing hearts. There's this scholar in Israel, amazing woman who interviewed all these operatives and also children who were moved during the during this time period. And, you know, to just discussing with them the emotions sort of at the moment and then in retrospect, but just to give you a few visuals. And then when I bring in the case of Roger, it's based on the history of the Finley brothers. This is a it was a pretty famous case of these two boys who were in a convent. Their parents perished in the Holocaust and the father's wishes was that if any of his sisters survived, that they would come and get their sons. And actually one of the sisters who did survive, an aunt of these boys was last name is Rosner and she lived in Israel and she was petitioning to get the boys back. And the, at that point, the church baptized them, took them on the run, wouldn't give them back. They were defying court orders. They were, the clergy were in jail at points. There was all kinds of, fighting going on you know and then eventually they they won the case and these boys ended up in israel but it was one of these kind of crazy cases it went on forever and in fact the order there's a scholar at brown who got the archives opened and he was like first in line and kind of found out that the order to keep these children from returning to this Jewish family were like it went so high up in the papacy it was like from above you know don't let them go back so that was the case that Roger is sort of very loosely based on Roger's totally fictionalized character, but there's this history I was thinking about. And then in the case of um, the Germanized Germanization of Polish children, mostly Christian children, you know, the Germanization program was by him, you know, started by Himmler. It was to take pe children whose you know, if measured in this number of 60 something places, their eye charts, their caliper charts, you know, all this kind of way, if they could pass these, these um, racial testings, um, they could be raised by German couples and or put into these Germanized schools. And, um, and in probably in their mind, it would be better to be German, because being, you know, being Polish was to be in a sub, you know, a sub, you know, a sub um yeah not as good you know it's the, the this is yeah and so there were these ideologies about oh hang on that i'm gonna get out of here now um we can talk about my Joshka dolls later stop share um uh so you know there was just like i was fixated on the idea that adults for a variety of reasons were moving children around they you know some of them they they shouldn't be made into equivalencies like the jewish people who are trying to reclaim jews after the annihilation of this entire you know set of people is totally different than you know what the germans were doing or what even what the church was doing but but from the child's perspective from the struggles they had there that's where i was coming in and trying to sort of show the complexity the psychology and the experience of children in the war. Right. So, you know, when you talk about the, um, the moving of children during wartime, um, or not even during wartime, children being moved and taken by adults, um, how, when you, as a Jewish person, when you were dealing, when you were writing this, were you grappling with that? Because I have to tell you, as the reader, um, I was coming into this saying, oh, how heroic that these Jewish um, ac activists were going from farm to farm, house to house, 
to bring these children back to the Jewish people. And yeah. um, the book exposes me to a different dimension of that. Um, so how did, how did you grab yeah. with that? Thank you. It's a great question. I think that it was, oh, in, in my own personal opinion, it's genuinely morally blurry. <laughs> so like, I think there are a lot of cases in our world that aren't that morally blurry. I think this one really is. And the reason it's blurry is because there's the, like when you think of Judaism as a collective that we are trying to protect, it was totally heroic and and it was a matter of you know grave importance to try to retrieve the jews the jewish the remaining Jew, the few remaining jewish children you know what i mean like it we were you know and so this was, was like a very noble mission and in their minds they were doing something that you know you know it was righteous but the 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 need the the kind of the needs of the collective are in sometimes pitted against the needs of an individual so like on the from the level of the individual child who might finally be bonded after losing their first family and now they're in a second family and to be taken from that situation again you know what like the ruptures were just profound and some of the operatives who did this work really believed in themselves all the way through as saving these children but other Others believed it at the front, and then in retrospect, having followed some of them, the one man followed every child he had moved, you know, and he was he stayed connected to them, tried to stay in touch with them. And in his in retrospect, felt like the psychic damage made it such that it probably wasn't worth it in some of those cases, that it wasn't the right thing in some of those cases. So I think when you think about it in terms of like the history of our people, it feels like the right thing to have done. But when you think of it as there's the collective and then there's the individual, there might have been cases in which it was really painful and that it was a it was a big rupture for those children. So and to have left one or a couple children behind, like what did it matter? Do you know what I mean? There was sort of this feeling too. The man was like, we might have left a couple and they would have been a, they wouldn't have been as damaged. And it just because yeah, it was it, it was really tough. And here's something interesting. There's a little bit of an analogy in the, when the Germanized children, when there, when it became to light that Germans had taken Polish children and, and put them into these settings, the UNRRA after the war tried to repatriate some of those children as they were trying to find those children. So there was something kind of oddly <laughs> parallel. And there's this scholar, or I mean, she's amazing. This woman, Gita Sereni, um, she talks, she was one of these women who went into the German homes trying to take these children back to their Polish families. And from her perspective, again, it's like these Polish families, they lost their children as babies or young children. They wanted them back. They were their parents, you know what I mean? They wanted their children back. And then when she got to the German home, the children only sort of knew these German families because that's where they've been living for years. And the idea of pulling them out was so painful. So I think it was just really complicated. And I think that I want to say a few things. The woman who told me about her work as a operative at some times used these words like I stole the children or I kidnapped them. She used words like that. And then later she felt upset about those words. And then there was this conversation I had with her where it was like, you know, there might not have been a vocabulary for this situation at all. And I think when you talk about genocide and when as a person in you know 2023 in my house in massachusetts writing about a genocide all i can say is the utmost humility is required and to say i have no like it's very hard to know at on the ground at the time like i'm not judging i'm saying it's complicated morally but i realize that you know these children were stowed for their safekeeping for like what should have been you know they figured i'll put them in there for a month or two and hopefully we'll be back and get them right away then the parents die, the, the fam they've been in the family for four years. You know what I mean? They don't have parents, they don't have papers. When someone comes to take them back, it's like, who do they belong to? There's like a true conundrum, you know? And, um, and I, so, I, so I really respect that on all sides, it's just so complicated. And um, I guess personally, I've thought a lot. I have, you know, I have a, sort of this 
I'm really interested in all this history, but there's something personal in my own life, which is that we're the hearing parents of deaf children. And when we had our first daughter, I wrote a story in, in the, actually in the New York Times about how sort of all across the world, you know, a parent births a baby and the baby inherits the language and culture of their parents. This happens everywhere. This is how it is, right? If you're in Lithuania and you have a baby, it's, it's learn, you know, this is what it learns. And if you're in Greece, it learns, whatever. But when you're a hearing parent of deaf children, all of a sudden there's this question, like, should you be raising the child that you're not deaf and they are and all this stuff. And, and someone wrote in the comments, like, she shouldn't be raising these children. They should be taken from her and raised by deaf people. Okay, so my kids didn't grow cilia or it was broken or something bent in their ear they can't hear this is the reason right <laughs> that that i shouldn't raise my babies and meanwhile you know it's like is anyone asking about like our intimacy level our bonds our connection who loves these children <laughs> like is you know they're sort of talking about something more ideological and so i mean i'm interested in that i'm also interested in the fact that just to be totally i don't know transparent about my thought process the Jews were persecuted as Jews and no one was asking anything. Are you religious? Are you this? Like, not, that, not that it matters, but I'm just saying they were, it was like, as Jews, you were persecuted. And if you were a child at the end of the war and they wanted to try to rebuild Judaism, it was as Jews that you were taken back. It wasn't like, are you bonded? Are you connected to this family? Any, nothing. It was like, you're Jews, you need to come. And, and now that was in response to the Lost Collective. And like, so I understand it. But I think that the the complexity that you know of the of the child child's experience and psychology of it is sort of overlooked in that move. Right, and I think it, it is very complicated and it's very heart wrenching. You know, um, Abe Foxman, the emeritus head of the Anti Defamation League, one of the most famous hidden children in the world, um, was um, stayed with that family for a while and then. Um, uh, returned to the Jewish people and became one of the most important Jewish figures of the 20th century. And, um, and he has spoken about this. So I think it is, it is complicated. And especially when you bring Israel into it and um, the important role that these children and other survivors played in building the state of Israel. I almost felt like Israel was another character in the book. Um, and I'm wondering if you can talk about that because I've often been struck by the generational difference. Um, you know, when I um, was in Israel and I went to the Begin Museum and um, saw the, that he had seen his parents slaughtered before the age of five, um, it helped me to understand how he and those of his generation coming from Europe were the ones who founded the state of Israel. And I think that's very much in the book, them going to this kibbutz and where they wind up, some in kibbutzim, some in cities. Can you talk about that and the role of Israel um, in the Yeah, form? I mean, I think that what I can say is just that there, you know, there was so much trauma um, for the people who were, who were, even before, you know, the state of Israel was found, I mean, they were getting them to Palestine, getting them to Eretz Israel, And these are the experiences they were bringing with them. And, you know, I think that it's really easy for people who haven't lived that sort of trauma to have trouble understanding the reactions of people who are reacting in a in a context of trauma. And the thing is that, you know, I do believe in that sort of epigenetic research as well. And that like, it's a cellular thing. And like, I I've, I think that um, it can't be overlooked and it needs to be understood more. And it, and it's, um, it's, it's a part of being empathic and sensitive to the history like that, you know, sometimes people cordon off the history by these dates, like, well, the war ended and you know what I mean? Like, but that's not right. I mean, like to say that you witnessed the murder of your parents before you were five years old and then you went on, well, this is in your, you know, this is your experience and how you, you know, this is a, your lens. And, um, and, and it is also kind of in the genes of your children and whatever. So I think that um, I thought it was really important that these, that 
you sort of saw who was populating Israel. And um, one thing that I did somewhat intentionally, and I don't know how it reads, but <laughs> it was important to me that sometimes my characters interfaced and it was very subtle. Like no one said like, oh, that happened to you. That happened to me too. I mean, like <laughs> there is nothing like that, right? You go into a store, you buy a box from some guy and then you leave, right? And the reader knows that they share a lot of experience, but the people, and, but that's how it is in Israel. Do you know what I mean? Like, like this is true every day in Israel, like this, you know? And so I thought that it was just, I don't know, worth noting that you you know you don't need to be at some weird like child stolen conference <laughs> you know like to understand this like it's actually your everyday life and you're interfacing all the time and this is what's orienting you in the world and this is part of the fabric and tapestry of Israel i was very struck by the fact that regardless of how each character felt about what had happened to them they all remained in israel and um, being Israeli, that was their home. And yeah. um, and that was what even, you know, Roger, who really was struggled with leaving Catholicism behind, he stayed in Israel. And so there was, to yeah. me, there was something very powerful about that. Um, I'd like to get to the character of Renata because she's so important in the book. And as you've alluded to there, um, and this is one of the things I learned, I never knew about the Polish children who were Germanized. I kept thinking Renata must be Jewish. She must, there must be something where she's Jewish and she's not. And um, of course I frantically Googled it. And yes, it's true. There were hundreds of thousands of Polish children who were Germanized. And so I, um, I'm wondering about your thought processes as you were writing, because there's so much happening right now uh, in uh, the, uh, political sphere, the global political sphere between Poland and Israel, between Poland and the global Jewish community about efforts to um, create some equivalence between Polish victims of the Holocaust and Jewish victims of the Holocaust, which of course the Israeli government has pushed back against um, stridently um, yeah. with good reason. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could talk about that. Why include Renata in this, yeah. um, is, are you making an equivalency? If not, how does her story connect with the stories of the Jewish characters? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I think that, I felt it was really important to include multiple stories. And one reason, I guess, honestly, was something protective of the Jewish reclamation movement. Because if I had only written a story of Jews coming to reclaim Jews and the struggles that those children underwent, it I felt that there was a risk of, uh, so now, you know, Jewish people were going back and taking them and it was bad for them and, you know, like whatever. I, even though I believe that the, the intention was very much to preserve Judaism and it was a, trying to save those children, etc. But I felt like once I learned that all these adults are doing this to children generally during wartime and not only during wartime, like it felt important to me as a generalized story about adults and how they think of children, how they think of the future of their the future of each of these places because of what where the children go, G children being the future kind of and that idea. Um, so I think that's a different kind of concern was to try to sort of equalize the fact that this has been going on everywhere by all peoples in some sense and that it's that's just true, but again, not to draw a generalization there's no gen I mean there's no equivalency to be drawn between Jews trying to reclaim Jews after the Holocaust and Nazis trying to Germanize children. like that is not at all an equivalency. Um, like I said earlier maybe from the child's perspective, there's something similar about how they cope and et cetera, what the struggles are from it. I think that the situation, the, I think what's also hard is that, you know, Poland, you know, like I mentioned, was so vehemently anti-Semitic as a country. And it, and, and it was, you know, there were these righteous people within Poland and, um, 
you know, some, so, so there were people who would save a Jew and stuff, but there were so many denouncers and there was so much of that, that it's like kind of impossible to have this conversation. Like everyone suffered during the war, but, but some of them were suffering at the hands of the people you're now saying, you know, suffered terribly. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, like it's that's just, the problem, right. That's the problem, right? It's like, okay, but you're the ones denouncing them and they go to their death. I mean, and so then to say there was a lot of suffering, it's, it's just, it, it's just a big mess in that regard. I mean, Renata as a character and talking as just as an as a novelist, I want to say, you know, I was I. It's funny, we were talking before this, you know, before we got on to the larger zoom about how much to share and I just want to say there's something that I think is kind of important, which is that Renata is a child who is taken very young to be Germanized. And by the time she's sort of growing up in the German family, she doesn't even know she's not German. And um, she, so the only consciousness in the novel that knows her backstory is this little doll that she has been carrying with her. So while she was in the park with her Polish mom and the German soldiers came, she was clinging to her little Matryoshka doll who came you know, over the clattering train and whatever and went with her. And this becomes the witness for the reader. It becomes like, Renata's backstory is held only by the doll and Renata doesn't even know it. And I, I wanted to do that because I learned of, I was watching these movies of the discovery that Germanized, I learned of these 80 year olds who learned that they weren't German and it was shocking. They had lived their whole life thinking so. And one of them like went back to Poland and was trying to like retrace and meet, meet the his childhood people. But the sister was like, no. I'm German. Like, you know, it was so hard for her sense of identity just to have this kind of sense of things all turned on their head when, you know, when you've lived your whole life thinking this. But so it's kind of a complex story about like how we even ever kind of come to know, you know, our, our pat, if, if things are kept secret from you as a, as a child, you know, how do you kind of get there and how does your identity form around all of this stuff? So that's not really the political answer. I mean, the, I think, you know, my answer to the situation with Poland and Israel is just that I think that what's, what's a real, it, they weren't exactly neutral with respect to Jews during the war. So it's a bit hard to say after, you know, they sort of directed persecution of Jews during the Holocaust that it's equivalent. Thank you. So I want to encourage people to post questions in the Q&A function. Um, and I'd really like to open it up um, to observations and questions from uh, the folks who are on the Zoom. Um, and while people are posting questions, I'll just, um, uh, you know, ask a few more questions. How did you choose the title? What is the meaning of home? Why did you yeah. talk Why did about I... that in the book? Yeah. I mean, first of all, I liked this title because of the once, actually, <laughs> because I felt like there was this ambiguity in like once we were home could have been that at one time at the beginning, maybe we were home, but it also could be once we were home, meaning once we were in Israel <laughs> or once, you know, like like it's sort of ambiguous and these children are sort of shifting between a read on that all through probably, you know, their childhoods because there's so many shifts in their experience and um and as regards home or you know the nature of family i mean that is kind of these are the things i'm like really trying to raise when and and you know roger experiences these quandaries it's a, it's like you know nature of home and family who are you connected to but nature of your sense of belief and if you only if you believe in a christian god and then you are brought to you know, learn to pray to a Jewish God. And then maybe you're not even sure you're praying to any God. And like, how are you supposed to settle as a self when these questions of faith are, are, are hanging in the balance? And, and then, you know, I think that, you know, each character is dealing with questions of like how to root, how to, how to root after rupture. And, um, you know, if home has been ripped away from you, at least once and possibly twice, I think in all my characters' cases, it could be, um, you know, how do you ever find that place? And I think that's one reason why all of the children seem to have something made of wood. Like Anna has a spinning top and Oscar works with these boxes and Renata's holding her doll and Roger writes in a notebook that's 
essentially pulp wood, you know, um, and um, it's like the rooted earth and the and Oscar touches the tree and hopes the roots will carry the message back to the farm or that, you know, will it, you know, branch by branch get his you know, him, his message back to the Dabrowski's where he did feel at home. Um, and so I don't know, there was, there's a way in which it really is about what is root rootedness and especially for children like this who are moved around. And I guess I wanted it to be thought about that there were, that this is happening still, that Ukrainian children are currently sitting in some Russian you know, center and one wondering, you know, all these same questions that my characters are going through, or if you're separated from your parents at the border and you there, you know, all of this stuff that's happening and happens. Okay. Um, I am wondering if I'm seeing any questions. Um, maybe they were in the chat. Yes. Um, okay. So one question is, can you talk more about the children when they were adults? How did they understand their trauma? Hmm. That's a good question. I mean, they're, they all have some real differences and I think I try, so actually in order to really flesh out the complexity of the redeeming of Jewish children, or I just want to mention that there was like a linguistic disagreement because they were calling it the redemption of Jewish children and some people called it retrieval or reclamation but then someone there was a move to sort of call it rescue but there was this revolt because the rescue families were those Polish Christians who were or not just Polish Christians but other Christians who really like saved them from <laughs> and so they retreated on that and then some called it ransoming because they were offering money I mean it was very complicated but what I wanted to get through there is that for a child who was seven when they were stowed, you know, went for safekeeping and really remembered their Jewish roots, their sense of self as an adult, I think might be less convoluted than a child like Oscar, who was three when he was in the, you know, put into the Polish home and is supposed to have, you, you know, I think like there, I've read in some of these cases that you know, someone would feel disloyal to their birth parents if they bonded with the rescue family. Um, it's, it was so tricky because, and also there was always this hope that they might come back. And then, I don't know, I think that in each case, it was really different how they coped as adults. And it all had to do with the bonds they had as children, the memories they had as children, you know, how old they were when this sort of thing was happening. Yeah, and it's really overarchingly the relationships. And that's how it, it, it kind of, I'm just trying to see if I'm even answering this question. It, it's, <laughs> um, it's just that, like, I think it was individual, person by person. Um, next question is, did any children, did children go back to their adopted homes as adults to reunite? Um, and um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I um, portray that Oscar does go back um, to, to see them. And so does Anna, in fact. But I also want to say that, you know, I interviewed hidden children actually initially for the Yellowbird Sings. And there's a woman in our area who, you know, she went again and again to the family who harbored her during the war. And I think that's not uncommon of the family. If you were in a rescue family that you felt bonded with, and you know they saved your life and you know even if you get even if you are returned with your biological family maybe you know settled elsewhere i mean there was this real it could be that they would go back again and i i did represent that right i mean that's something that we hear about so often from our uh, Holocaust survivors, um, when they share their show on narratives in classrooms and with groups. Um, people who have remained so close to the families that saved them, who were righteous Gentiles. Um, and I know one survivor who speaks very frequently at schools in our area talks about how uh, there was a court case um, after the war to determine her custody and that the Jewish parents uh, uh, were victorious and custody was granted to them. And you would think that there would be tension between the families, given the fact that there was litigation, but actually the families remained very, very close. Um, because I think that just creates 
um, what a bond, how could it not? And, um, um, you know, and one of the interesting things comparing and contrasting your books is that um, it seems that in Once We Were Home, all of the, the, the hidden children, I believe, were in positive situations relatively when they were hidden. Um, and um, that they then develop these attachments. And I thought that was interesting compared to the yellow bird sings where the farmer hides them and <laughs> is an abuser. Yeah. And I mean, I think that there are, it's a modeled thing in both books, maybe less modeled in Once We Were Home, but you know, the person, Madame Mercier, who's in charge of Roger's upbringing, I mean, she's a nightmare and she, um, you know, is behind the kind of baptizing and taking him, uh, you know, on. Um, and a lot of it's for her like sense that, and this is sort of based on some things I read of one person who, you know, just felt that they had put themselves out in this way. And it was like, they deserved the child, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, um, you know, or that they weren't gra gra you know, enough, there wasn't great enough gratitude and so, or whatever. And I think it, it's always like this when, I mean, as a novelist, like the goal would be to show the roundness of experience. And so like, there were people like Sister Brigitte who was a really, you know, a very good egg, right? You know, <laughs> um, but then there would also be nuns and priests or whatever who were, you know, kind of going sideways. And and so I think that um, it was a range. There was such a range, and that's how it is in humanity, right? Like like the, you know, and um, and yeah, it's like the whole gamut of experience. I think and it's always good to try to represent it because you know it's it's just everything and in all sides like you, you know i mean it's just how human nature is i noticed in this book and i'm wondering if it was a coincidence i noticed a bunch of references to birds um and um i was thinking boy um is this supposed to hark back to the yellow bird sings where bird a bird was just so important is that just a coincidence I mean, I have that Oscar is very much rooted in nature and trees and the birds flitting from branch to branch, but then in his own personal trajectory, something happens that links up right to the yellow bird sings. And so, yes, there's a intentional connection there. I'm not yeah. going to spoil that part. <laughs> is, is really um, is touching because it, it just makes sense in terms of why you chose to cover this this topic. Um, you know, if people are, do people have other questions? Do people feel like they would rather use the hand function, which would also be completely fine? And then I can unmute you. Um, I wanna make sure that I'm not dissuading anybody from asking any questions. Um, uh, so, um, you know, one thing, there was a column that was, uh, uh, as long as nobody's asking um, other questions. There was a column recently that um, talked about um, the, now that Holocaust survivors, um, the number of them is dwindling, time is passing, that there will be heightened importance for the role of fiction, historical fiction related to the Holocaust to um, as a, a, an important tool in the toolbox for Holocaust education um, and uh, humanizing Jews and Judaism. Um, how have you found that? And how have, how is the book received by non-Jewish audiences? And um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's really important. You feel like, different kinds of writing, you know, kind of touch people in different ways, right? And so like when you heard, when you would read memoirs and true accounts and you were following a particular person's story, it was very moving in one, in this, in that way. 
But sometimes fiction can generate a kind of empathy, um, you know, just like by creating these particular characters in a very particular way that don't doesn't have to track reality in any, you know, in any way. And so it kind of opens up. And that's, you know, people say this generally about about fiction that you can, you know, develop empathy through the, um, you know, by writing and then the, for people reading it. And um, I mean, I think that the understanding of the history, the education of the history, and and more importantly, connecting it to your own humanity and like your sense of identification. Because if you can identify with this character, you know, it's a totally different story than just hearing. Yeah, you know, and um, I mean, it's interesting. I had a book club last night and um, a person said that they're a Christian person who was uh, or a Catholic person who, um, you know, said that when they first began the novel, because it starts with Roger and he's, um, you know, got an ear twist by the nun and, you know, they were worried. They were like, oh, wow, you know, <laughs> it's going to be like, you know, a certain thing. And then felt like it was very balanced and like rounded because the thing is, I feel like there were, you know, people who were, there were just, there were really righteous people on all sides at times obviously there were very unrighteous people as well right and um and and just absolute horrific things happening but but you know for the people who went out of their way and saved people or protected them at their peril i mean but uh, yeah i think that um it's been received well i i think it um from all sort of communities knock on wood <laughs> Right. Because I certainly didn't mean, you know, it, I was exploring. And I think that, you know, I see that as part of my nature as a philosopher and, and in fact, also as a Jewish person to sort of ask questions and really challenge, wonder, a debate. And, you know, that's what I do. And so, you know, maybe at the, on uh, first glance, when it says the hidden history of stolen children, it, it worries people, it raises up your hackle, you know, whatever. But I think that like, when you're in this novel, you understand that it's coming from a place of humility and compassion on all sides, you know, so or at least that's the intention. And oh, um, Miriam Galston has a question and I need to just um, allow the, her not to be muted. So I'm going to do that now. Um, all right. So Miriam, uh, are you unmuted now? No, you are not. Uh, let me try. Um, I, hmm. How do I unmute you, Miriam? Can you just go? I you think I did it, it. You did it yourself. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Um, first of all, this is fascinating. And you can imagine that tomorrow, uh, this is the book I'm going to be reading. Um, but I wanted to ask you, you referred to motives and you said, for some people who were very poor, money was the motive. But presumably, there were lots of other motives. Can you talk a little bit about the motives um, that you've come across in your various experiences with people who were the rescue families? Yeah, thank you. I mean, first, what I wanted to say is just to be clear about what I said there. When I said that they would they would relinquish the child and take the money after, at the end of the war in 1946 and 47, when the you know people came to try to reclaim Jewish children sometimes the thing that would enable the relinquishment was the offer of money and i think that that i just want to say i mean there was a lot of poverty and it was a huge you know struggle to be feeding and so like it, it i think that it it wasn't necessarily like we didn't love them enough we needed to get the money or whatever i think though that they were under some serious financial duress and sometimes they did it and also i think though that there were people who believed that you know they were put in my safekeeping but they are jewish children and should go back to judaism you know and and i tried to animate that too where when oscar comes and visits the dabrowski's she the the you know chucha agata says you know maybe it was best because your parents would have wanted it you know i think that for you know th there was a big idea about trying to honor the wishes of the parents who died 
you know, thinking that they didn't actually intend to give their children over to Christianity. I mean, they intended to give their child over to this family to hide them so that they would be safe during the war. And they intended to come back and get them and that they would bring them back to their family and being back to Judaism. So there is this idea that, um, you know, it was it was an, in some sense honoring those wishes. I also want to say that there were people who wouldn't give their children to a Christian family just in case that they would end up being raised Christian. <laughs> you know, like I've read those stories too, where it just was a one bridge too far sort of to, to, to give up your child into a Christian setting just in case they ended up having to, you know, get raised that way. So, I mean, I think there were these different kinds of considerations of, you know, kind of Again, I mean, in some sense, it might come up to you know how yeah how the how the parent had intended the child to be raised, how you try to respect those wishes, um, but also there was just these sort of functional things too, like you know there was a lot of persistence by the people trying to reclaim the Jewish children. They would go again and again. Sometimes they would try to initiate court cases to see if they could reclaim them, and um, you know there were just all these kind of different methods, and and so there were different reasons why some like a, you know, Christian family might then say, you know, we took care of this child for this many years, and now we're going to let them go back to the Jewish group. Right. Um, who was funding the effort to reclaim yeah. the Jewish kids? Yeah. I mean, it's funny. I, I, I have I somewhere in a pile of stuff, I kind of listed them out. I feel like there were certain groups that were willing to fund certain things and not other things. And they were like very clear about that, like certain committees, Polish committee, the Jewish community, whatever they wouldn't, they would like let you go for this project, but not for the reclamation project or whatever. Um, I feel like I read somewhere that the joint provided some money in this regard and there was a guy in palestine like i don't know if he was a rabbi offering sort of raising money for this i i can i might have to email you the answer like i don't have it right in front of me but you know there was a lot and actually that's very well documented especially in the book dividing hearts which i showed you earlier like sort of how it was funded and there was another source of interest um who wrote about the some of that funding, et cetera, at the mercy mercy of strangers? Um, he also this guy Nakam Bogner. Both of these books are published by Yad Vashem, um, wow. and um, they talk a lot about like the the funding of the project, the political arguments because sort of the Zionists thought they would take these children and teach them Hebrew and get them to Palestine. And then other very religious groups didn't want to do that, but wanted them to be in a particular kind of children's home in Europe. And um, so there were also disagreements about like ultimately where the children should go if, you know, once reclaimed. And so there were like factions within that, that had different ideas about what to do. And so when it was run by some of the like youth group sort of based ones they tended to be zionist and yeah so it was it was complicated jews engaging in internal disputes shocking <laughs> imagine imagine that yeah imagine that. so was the yellow bird sings i know it was translated into many languages was it translated into polish into german um that <laughs> hebrew that's the Hebrew. It was in Polish. It was in very interesting languages. So Polish and then Bulgarian and Czech and Hungarian and um, Spanish and Portuguese and not German that I know of, actually. I don't think I have a German. And it's funny because this novel, I haven't heard yet much about the foreign rights that usually comes a bit after, at least for me it does. Um, and. I feel like I hope it'll get translated in the languages where these children like so it should be in French, German, you know, and 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 in Hebrew, right? right. Um, and Polish. And Polish. Um, I I know, and I I mean, everyone though, you know, you think about Israel right now, and you're like, yeah, I don't know about like whether foreign rights is top of mind <laughs> in Israel, and and same with Poland, and you know, especially the Ukraine nearby, and like you know, each of these situations. So I'm just you know thinking this isn't. Uh, I, I'm not going to learn about this right now. Right. Wow. What was the Polish reaction to the Yellow Bird Sings? 
it was really positive. It actually like won this like reader's choice award thing that well, I was worried because like, you know, the farmers coming in and the not one of the nuns is really quite brutal. And there it wasn't a, all pretty, right? You know, there were righteous people and there were good people and there were also really bad people. And again, I think that we need to, you know, accept that it, it's, it's all of us. Like we, there are really wonderful and really, <laughs> you know, not wonderful of all of us, you know what yeah, I mean? And, and um, it, that's just to be true. Like, and, um, and so like, I'm, I was appreciative that it wasn't like, you know, there wasn't some knee jerk reaction to the fact that there were some good people and some bad people, because like, this is all humanity. So interesting. So interesting. Other, any other, uh, other questions? Um, you know, someone wrote somewhere and asked me if I had read a book Yes, uh, I was going to raise that. It's not related to this book. It's related to like um, deafness in my family, maybe. Exactly. And I, I have not read it, but I'm going to take note and, and try to find it. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, I, I had said that I would address it at, at the end of our conversation. So oh, okay. So, okay. Approaching. so um, I really want to thank you so much for joining us to, to talk about um, this really incredible work. You know, the more you think you've seen everything and read everything about the Holocaust, and I think that there is this sometimes an attitude of, you know, well, Judaism is about more than the Holocaust, which it most certainly is. And there's this uh, interesting debate now whether the how helpful is Holocaust education even to combating anti-Semitism? Dara Horn just wrote um, a very thorough piece in the Atlantic about this. Um, but there's always something new to learn, something new yeah. to mind that has not been explored before. And I think that um, this book for me reminds me of that. Um, and that there's also, um, an essential truth about the human experience that has universal application, um, you know, especially for, for a book like this. Um, so um, I, wanna, I wanna thank you so much for being with us. Um, once we were home, it is available on Amazon. And what's the website for independent oh, book trailers? Bookshop.org. Bookshop.org. And, um, you know, just um, thank you so much for sharing your work with us. It's so incredibly powerful. Um, and if there are people on the call who um, would like to be in touch with you because they would like to have you speak to their book group or they would like to have you speak to another group that they're involved with, where can they find you to do that? Thank you. Yeah. And thank you so much for having me. Um, so I have a website. It's new. It's it's um, it's functional, not as charming as my old non-functional website, <laughs> but functional. Um, and it's my name, Jennifer Rosner, but there's a dash between it. So it's Jennifer-Rosner.com. As it turns out, there's several other Jennifer Rosners. And um, so there, there, there's like a contact um, thing. And I can also put if I, I think, let's see if I can do this, you know, my technical skills, um, there's, you can always email me. I'll just put it in there. It's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I'd be happy to, to, uh, to talk to, okay, there you go. Jennifer.Rosner, Jennifer-Rosner.com. And then there's my email. So if you can see that, um, yeah, yeah. I'd be happy to, talk about the novel. I'm really trying to share it, um, you know, as widely as I can. And I think there is a, be a lot to talk about and it's morally complicated, so. Absolutely, and so relevant to everything that we are confronting now, both within the Jewish people and in the world. And I'm so happy because when I first met you, in 2020, your first novel had come out and it was in airports all over the country and there were no people in airports because it was <laughs> April 2020. Exactly. And so we were thrilled that you were available to join us on Zoom. And um, now I saw that it is available in airports and there are people there to buy it. So 
Um, and we have made it through what was a really hard period. So, yeah. so thank you again so, thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great to talk to you. Great to be here. Thank you. Take care. Good night, everybody.